Okay, good evening, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to the annual NNA conference and our panel discussion about the new wave of regulatory and compliance efforts that are affecting the mortgage finance industry and you specifically as notary signing agents. As you all know, the nation's lenders and title companies face a growing wave of federal regulation and compliance initiatives that are geared toward improving the mortgage lending process and ensuring a safe, secure, and consistent experience for the consumer. These, these regulatory mandates have a significant impact on signing professionals because ever since the financial crisis of 2008, mortgage lending uh, operations have consolidated and you, the notary signing agent, are oftentimes the only person that sees the consumer face to face. To discuss these upcoming regulatory changes and their impact on signing professionals, we have assembled a distinguished panel of leaders from both the lending and title industries. So I'd like to take a few minutes and have each of the folks sitting here to my right introduce themselves and tell us the companies they work for and their roles, and then we'll start the questions from there. So we'll start here with Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Murphy. I currently serve as Executive Vice President at Value America. Uh, my primary responsibilities are overseeing the day-to-day -day operations, compliance, and business development efforts. Good afternoon. I'm Sally Frudenberg. I am from Wells Fargo Home Mortgage in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where winter has finally ended. And uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I said I went from my furnace to my air conditioning in 48 hours. Um, I am part of our settlement agent strategy team, and um, we're focused on uh, evolving our strategy for how we're going to meet all of the financial reform changes and third-party oversight requirements that are coming from the regulators. Hi, I'm Ryan Flaherty. I'm the Vice President in Charge of Service Links Closing Agent Vendor Management Division and our Scheduling Division. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll repeat that. Uh, my name, is this even on? It's on. Is it? Okay. <laughs> my name's Ryan Flaherty. I'm in charge of Service Links Closing Agent Vendor Management Division and uh, our Scheduling Division. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Zaki, and Hi. I'm. <laughs> How about now? Great. My name is Sam Zaki, and I'm with First American Mortgage Services. I am a senior client executive for our company, and I manage uh, a handful of some of the top lenders in the nation and working with various executives in those offices. Is it on? <laughs> Hi. My, my name is Jim Sloan, and uh, I've been with uh, Chase and predecessor companies for 37 years. Uh, I currently uh, manage uh, our vendors in our title, flood, credit and verification spaces in, the, in our uh, originate, mortgage origination space, and I do that uh, across the country. So I spoke about the importance of a secure transaction, and the first topic I'd like to discuss with our panelists this evening relates to the information security protocols and the importance of protecting the borrower's non-public personal information, otherwise known as NPI. So I'm going to go ahead and start here with, uh, with Sam and, and Sean and Ryan and ask you, what are the important steps signing agents need to take to protect the non-public personal information of the consumer? Go ahead and start with Sean. Uh, NPI obviously is of a great concern to everybody in the industry, whether it's from regulators, lenders, title companies, signing services, and, and yourselves. Uh, there are the obvious uh, you know, items that you've been trained on uh, repeatedly, whether it's password protection to various websites, um, double checking the intended recipients of emails when you're returning documents. Uh, fax numbers whenever you're faxing documents and oftentimes making sure you're returning the signing package to the correct title company. I'm sure Ryan and I have exchanged quite a few packages over the years. So um, I, I think a lot of it really comes down to basic organization and uh, I think the more you prepare for your signings, the more that you have things printed out, uh, organized properly and secured in your vehicles, uh, when you go out to the signing locations, the, the better your security efforts will, will, will prove um, worthy. Um, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't be doing the NNA justice if I did not uh, 
hint that you should definitely utilize their product, the Privacy Guard, relative to their uh, the, the notary journals. Obviously, that's a, a very important piece. Is uh, that's a very private matter. And Ryan, you've had to deal with some of the, uh, the, the NPI violations in the past. What are some of the, the steps you recommend signing agents take uh, to ensure that they protect the consumer's information as much as possible? Uh, obviously, there's the standard items like keeping the documents in your trunk locked if you absolutely have to bring them with, you know, uh, if you're not with your vehicle. Um, one of the lar largest uh, information security incidents we have on a monthly basis is in relation to a Dropbox. We always recommend that uh, whenever possible, and I know that's not possible in rural areas, but uh, to the extent that you can drop packages in a man location and get a uh, receipt from the individual with the, at that handoff, uh, the better. We're able to track it better. We're able to work with the overnight couriers better if we have that information. Um, frequently, Dropboxes um, can be vandalized. Uh, we've had situations where UPS package gets dropped in a FedEx box and it may never resurface. Um, those all get escalated uh, for investigation and, and many times we're put in a position where we have to speak with the borrower and give them credit protection. Um, it can be very unnerving for the customer. Sam, any, any further thoughts on, on how First American deals with MPI and, and the signing agent network that may differ from Sean or Ryan? No real difference other than, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, going back to basics. So how you receive your documents, obviously, from a provider is one area, meaning that you receive it via a secured, a secured link and you are uh, making both two copies, right, one for the borrower and one for uh, the lender. Um, I think one of the most common items that I've heard is when... Uh, copies are made of the second set of documents at a Staples or a Kinko's and documents are left in the copy machine. So I would say check that very carefully and make sure you're cautious. It still happens and um, you know there's all a whole slew of uh, things that we have to do in order to mitigate risk after that point. I'm going to pick on the same three individuals with a follow-up question, but uh, what are the steps that your companies take to monitor the performance of the signing agents out there? How are they monitored to ensure they're meeting your NPI security needs? Okay, we'll start with Sean. I think a lot of it does have to uh, deal with our, you know, speaking personally for Value America, our preferred method is to work directly with the notary signing agent field. And by doing so, it really helps us control the transaction as much as possible. Whether that's you know, our preferred method of delivering documents to you through our vendor portal via secure download, um, not really relying on you know, an additional middleman to, to make sure that package gets to you timely in a complete manner. Um, we have a lot of technology capabilities on our side to see when you access our website, when you download the documents, when it's pulled down uh, and you know on the other side whenever the closing is completed when you can and should upload it directly back to our website so um, you know we do monitor that we have a dedicated vendor management team that grades all the vendors on a transactional basis so we do know the performance level Ryan same question I, I think by and large there's similarities between companies I think it's important for each of you to be cognizant of requirements for each uh, company you may be doing business with. What might be okay for Value America might not be okay for ServiceLink, might not be okay for First American. Um, we all have different requirements internally and, and with our different client bases. So uh, always be careful to follow the instructions. If there's ever a question as to what's acceptable or not, certainly ask before doing it. It's, it's better than perhaps getting blocked or removed from someone's network because you followed a procedure that was okay for one company but not another. And Sam, and how does, what are some of the things that First American does to monitor the, the notary performance regarding security? Really, I think it would be um, kind of redundant at this point because Sean and, and Ryan covered most of it. Um, I would say just make sure you're following any instructions, any flags or tags that are in the loan package when you receive the documents so that you are following the instructions given to you by the settlement agent. Okay, so 
to avoid being redundant, I'm going to go ahead and ask your clients now. Uh, what are the, uh, Jim, we'll start with you. What are some of the possible consequences to the, the, the mortgage lenders if there's a, a single NPI security breach? What, what are some of the consequences that you have to deal with? Personal information in all forms, whether verbal, paper, electronic, need to be properly protected during collection, use, storage, transmission, and disposal. The regulatory risks allow for fines and sanctions and not to mention the reputational risks that arise from such instances that have profitability impacts to our companies. This is an area that's getting increased attention both internally and externally. Sally, do you have anything to add from that from a lender perspective in, in terms of what the possible consequences are of MPI violations? I mean, Jim nailed it, but I will say one word to you, target. <laughs> Um, you know, Target is based in Minneapolis, and so I'm sure that you know our news was probably filled with a lot more detail about the Target incident than than might have made to your local news stations. But the devastation to that company has been enormous. You know, they've had uh, uh, leaders who have been you know either resigned, even the chairman or the CEO has has stepped down. Their reputation, um, the customer loyalty has you know, taken its toll in terms of, of profit and revenue to the company. And I think that while it certainly isn't the only incident in, you know, recent times, um, it's a good example of where, you know, we move from the academic conversations of what might happen to seeing the reality of how, you know, a very, you know, well-respected, I think probably, you know, well-run on the surface company can, can be impacted so quickly and so harshly by an incident like that. So. Um, I think it's been a real eye-opener for a lot of folks that, um, you know, maybe were concerned about it, but didn't really, it didn't really hit home quite, quite as much. So okay. I think it's, it's very important to keep the forefront in your minds. Okay. Well, thanks for all your, your feedback on the, the security issues, and that leads into our next topic, which is the vendor management efforts uh, that, that each of the, the settlement service providers are, are putting forth. And, and notary signing agents are being asked to, to complete more and do more to be eligible to to work for your organizations. Um, so I'd like to start with the, the settlement providers up here. Um, how does your company verify a signing agent's eligibility to work for your company? Uh, and we'll go ahead and start with Sam, because I'll reverse it up a little bit here. Well, that's probably a question well above my pay grade, but um, the expert is Mary Winbauer out in the audience. But we do have a qualification process, an application that's completed. Um, we verify uh, that they are actually certified by the NNA. That's one of our key criteria. Um, we also uh, look in our history bank. So we keep a database of all the notaries uh, that have worked with us uh, currently and in the past and the experiences that we have because we know that you may not necessarily work just for First American and it may not be all the time. Um, and, you know, um, I think more importantly, uh, we track uh, the service level that you provide moving forward. You're actually rated on every single signing. So uh, for us, the key is going to be that you are certified by the NNA as a starting point. Yeah, and, and Ryan, Sam kind of alluded to how each notary is, is, is rated on, on each individual signing. What are, what are some of the metrics that, that ServiceLink uses to, to monitor the performance of the signing agents out there? Uh, there's a, a number of factors we look at. Um, from your turn time on the return of documents, we obviously have, uh, we're judged on that by, by our lenders. We need to get those packages back quickly. Uh, obviously, most importantly is uh, your error ratio uh, and your, your performance uh, with the customer. Uh, we're able to track on a transactional basis through our audits uh, how, many, some, how many errors you may have had. Uh, our vendor management division will be reaching out to you to discuss what may have happened in order to educate you and and help prevent that same error from happening again um, so that we can keep you an active member of our network. Um, it, we also are, are regularly uh, trying to assist you in that by doing educational webinars and, and sending out informational messages. Um, we really encourage signing agents to be a part of that process, interact with us so that we can help you do your job better, uh, your extension of us and, and the lender. Uh, and in order for us to all succeed, we need your help. And Sean, regarding vendor management efforts, there's been a lot of emphasis put on background checks uh, in the last couple of years. Um, why is there so much emphasis on completing the background check uh, for your organization, and what's, what's the benefit to the consumer? Sure, well, I think uh, background checks are very important because we, as 
you know, my peers have uh, touched on, we are sending you oftentimes to a borrower's house, uh, which, you know, that is their private domain, that's their pride and joy, that's where they're most, you know, comfortable in their life. And so for us to knowingly send you into their house, uh, to me it's very important that we're not sending, you know, convicted felons. Um, you know, the, the emphasis of background checks, even on our own employees, uh, as they align with you know some Alta best practices measures out there, it's something we've always done. It's something we believe in, and it's something we require of all of our vendors. So we stand behind the effort, and it's definitely a requirement. Uh, you know, to for our own sake, for the customer's sake, and you know, uh, a lot of times companies like you know Sam Ryan and I, you know, we deal with the centralized lending environment. So oftentimes you are the only face. Uh, representing any party in the transaction. So we want to make sure we're sending, you know, the best professionals we can, and the background checks is just a piece of it. Okay. And, and Sally, what are some of the performance level metrics that you monitor in terms of the, the signing agent performance when you evaluate all your, your providers? Well, the reality is that when it comes to the relationship between the lender and the signing agents, we don't really have a direct relationship. We engage the service providers and they in turn um, engage you as a dependent provider or sometimes called the subcontractor. We hold um, the service providers accountable for standards and they in turn, as Ryan was giving you an example, um, will monitor your performance. The reality is that today the regulators have made it very, very clear that the lender is accountable for anything that a third party service provider is utilized to perform, any functions they're utilized to perform perform within the entire, you know, end-to-end -end life of the loan process. And so they, they don't have a carve-out that says, you know, I, I don't get to blame, you know, Sean or Ryan or Sam to say, well, you know, Wells didn't make that mistake, our service providers did. And they, in turn, don't get to say when they're being held accountable to Wells Fargo for their performance criteria that the mistake wasn't their fault, it was the, you know, signing agent's fault. We all have to partner together in order to succeed, you know, as an industry, and I think it just, you know, it, it, it's it's not really unique. We've we've had this relationship for a long time. Um, perhaps uh, one might think of it that the spotlight has been, you know, turned up a little bit, and just the expectations and the importance of us all partnering together to deliver that quality product that helps us all succeed with the customers and ultimately with the regulators is is really critical. And, and Jim, how often do you review the, uh, the standards, Sally was alluding to, of, of all your providers? We review our, uh, our performance uh, from our vendors on a weekly basis. And we, uh, we look at this from both an external um, and an internal basis. We have our uh, feedback from our mortgage bankers and our branch personnel. We also survey our borrowers, uh, every borrower. We have a very, very high response rates uh, to, to our surveys. Depending on the you know, nature of whether we get uh, a very, and most of the response rates positive to the performance of the signing agent. Uh, in that manifests itself where we, we would direct the, uh, our vendors uh, to direct more business to those signing agents with their positive results. On the flip side, you know, in rare instances where we get uh, uh, responses that aren't positive, we then exclude those uh, signing agents from our panels. The next topic I'd like to, to tackle here is, is the upcoming CFPB Know Before You Owe forms and rules that will be implemented as scheduled in August of 2015. Uh, the mortgage licensing process will change, uh, including an integration of the forms, the, the, the Truth and Lending Act and the, and the RESPA forms. So I'd like to start with Jim and Sally uh, regarding the upcoming changes as, as they foresee how things might shake out. And uh, really kind of ask, you know, how do you think your operations will change to adjust the new law uh, that requires borrowers to receive uh, loan documents three days prior to a signing? Can you go first? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the changes are obviously going to be significant. Uh, we've had, you know, internal policies and processes that have been on the books for a long time that had 
driven toward getting those documents into the hands of the settlement agent, um, you know, at least three days before closing. And I think, you know, the, anyone in this room, how, how often does that happen that you ever get the documents? Uh, yeah. So, so I won't kid you to say that we've got this one covered and it's a non-issue because it's a very big issue for us. Um, the difference in looking forward versus where we've been at in the past is that while it was a, a desired outcome in, you know, up until this point, it's a non-negotiable mandatory outcome as we look forward. And um, not only do we need to make sure that we can deliver the closing disclosure to the customer to meet that three-day requirement prior to signing, and by the way, it's signing, so your signing agents, uh, our, our attorneys have indicated to us that the, that the trigger is uh, they have to have received them three days prior to when they sign the note. So keep that, keep that thought in the back of your minds. But that um, we, we also have requirements for uh, redisclosing. So we have an obligation when criteria change or fees change, et cetera. Uh, some of those changes may c cause us to need to restart the three-day clock. Luckily, that uh, ended up being a relatively sm much smaller uh, set of circumstances that restarts that three-day clock than was in the original proposed rules, which I think was at one point a hundred dollar tolerance or something about uh, similar to that. But nonetheless, that we have changes that occur that you may be the first ones that are detecting that, you know, no, there was a miscommunication and, and you know, the product change that was requested or something of that magnitude might not have been caught and we need to make sure that you're plugged in and aware and have a really solid communication line with the service provider so that if you do find yourselves the, the ones being first aware of a change like that, you have a really solid and immediate communication line to let that change information flow back to us. So it's going to be, a, I think, a very, very significant industry change that um, is, is not going to be a, a magic solution for any of us. And Sam, uh, what, what are some of the changes you foresee in the signing process as a result of the, the RESPA TILA form integrations? Well, as a, uh, as a provider, and I think it's safe to say, you know, we're probably all in the same boat, and that is, it is a significant change. Uh, some of the questions that are still pending will be how the borrower or the consumer receives their documents three days prior. You know, is that something that's delivered via FedEx? Is it something that's sent to the consumer via, you know, access to a secured uh, portal or a secured link? I mean, I think those are still um, up in the air in terms of uh, finalization, and it will probably be uh, client-specific, meaning lender-specific, in terms of how that's done. Um, but I think, you know, to Sally's point, the key will be when you receive your set of documents, which hopefully should be at the same time. If you receive an updated set of documents, I think the first question in your mind should be, was the consumer provided a new uh, set of closing documents? So, I mean, those are kind of the, the safety gaps that we're going to have to work on collectively as an industry. I, I don't think it's, it's an answer that we could fully provide you today, just that's one of probably a hundred questions that are still pending. And, and Ryan, with the, with the, the three-day uh, disclosure requirement, uh, what do you think the benefits of the signing agents out in the crowd will be in terms of running their, and managing their day-to-day -day operations? I, I think conceptually we're all excited about that, um, perhaps having a, a easier flow throughout the month, um, a little more balance is, is exciting to all of us. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to see some some differences in workflow, some uh, changes to, to how things are done. Again, to Sam's point, I don't know that we have all the answers to that, and a lot of our lender partners are working with that now. So um, from our perspective, we reach out to, to our signing agents and say, you know, stay on top of education, listen to, to what's out there, read the news, um, and each of us, Sam, uh, Sean, myself, will be reaching out to, to you in the coming uh, year or so to uh, define a little more clearly um, the answers to where, where the industry is going to be going with these things. Okay. Uh, any opinion from any of our panelists on what they think loan documents will look like next year? More pages, less pages? Anyone want to tackle that one? It'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be perfectly clear. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, go ahead, Jim. I think the, the CFP, CFPB has done a, a real good job in trying to design and trying to meet the needs of, of the consumer. So uh, although I don't think uh, they'll be, that the forms will be shorter, I think they'll be clear for the uh, consumer. And I think it'll make it uh, easier on the signing agent because the clarity uh, will offer dur dur during the, the signing session um, it'll be, it'll reduce the number of uh, questions and explanations that the signing agent uh, will be required to answer. So I, I think it's a good thing. Okay. I think Chris, one other, one other comment, um, you know, one of the other byproducts of getting those documents to the customer three days as opposed to one day or maybe even an hour before <laughs> signing is that they'll actually have time to read them. And if they take the time to read them, that means that they're likely to have more questions. And I think we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of that because being prepared for how do we handle those questions, you know, which questions are the right questions where you as signing agents, you know, can and should be prepared to answer, which questions are ones, again, where you need to have that communication line so that if the customer does have a question they haven't addressed prior to you sitting down to sign documents with them to make sure that they you know, have the ability to get those questions asked and answered by the right party when that party is not you is going to be very, very important, and we, we need to remember that as well. Okay. Our, our, our next topic I'd like to talk about is, is, is future technology changes and, and, and get our panelists opinions on, on how they think science may change in the future with the, the use of technology. And I'm really ge geared, gearing this question more towards the HUD's recent ruling to allow the electronic signing of, of notes on a FHA transaction. Um, and so I'd like to start with uh, Sean to ask, what is the impact um, you think to your company of the HUD ruling that allows these notes to be signed electronically? And, and do you think electronic signings are a wave of the future? Sure, I certainly think they are. I think it's something that uh, the industry has wanted and desired for a very long time. Uh, for those that attended the e-notarization workshop earlier, uh, you could tell there already are some significant uh, investments from technology firms into some pretty cool technology that I, that I personally was impressed with. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to coordinating with the counties to accept that at the reporter's office. Uh, once we you know, achieve that hurdle, uh, I think it'll definitely take off like wildfire. And I'm pretty excited. Well, you touched on an interesting topic that, that Jim and Sally, I think, have a very difficult duty in, in, in managing a national operation with local rules for recording and notarization. So what are some of the challenges you foresee for a 50-state electronic solution uh, in the industry? You want to take that one, Jim? Sure. <laughs> the, the, well, the biggest would be the lack of consistency among the, the regulatory bodies, that, whether it's the, the, the national regulators or each state regulator. That will cause us the, uh, uh, the, the most pain initially. I can tell you, currently we've been, uh, in my business, we've been running a, a pilot with our VA business on, on Eastside. And it has been uh, uniformly successful. Uh, the, the, the customer satisfaction ratings uh, have uh, been almost perfect. Uh, so that, that's a change versus uh, in our other businesses, they run somewhere between 90, uh, 90, 93 percent. These are all between 99 and 100 percent. So I think there's uh, opportunity uh, to increase our customer satisfaction. I think w what would help me the most would be some consistency in the, in the regulation. Does anybody have the easy button for that one? I thought you did. No, no, I was looking at you. <laughs> okay. um, Ryan, what are some of the, the ways you think technology may shape the future of, of mobile signings to make the um, jobs of our signing agents in the crowd more efficient? So, I, you know, I think many of us may be familiar with uh, some, some lenders that have done mobile electronic signings in the past that haven't really gained a lot of, of momentum. But I, I think things are changing now. Um, we've got some buy-in. Um, from government organizations that are they're going to help us push this. Um, I think it's to, to Jim's point, uh, it's good for the, the borrower. Um, we're going to be able to deliver them documents early, perhaps like Sam, Sam was saying via a portal. Um, 
what our, we're hearing from our lenders is they want to be able to audit when the borrowers view these disclosures, um, push them to view them sooner, to help them through the process. So um, I think we're going to see in, in the next couple years a, a, a rapid change. Um, it's going to be good for the customer. It's going to provide more transparency in the process, and it's going to help you as a signing agent um, for your piece in the transaction, dealing with a, a better educated borrower, hopefully less of those trips out at nine at night that result in a no close and in the middle of the rain or snow and something like that. You know, so hopefully we can get you out to your appointments and um, get you signed the first time. And Sean, what about uh, what are some of the ways Value America is utilizing technology in the assignments for the notaries or distributing the docs? What are some of the things you're doing as a company? Well, right now we're really focused on you know just having the signing agents come to our portal to download the documents. The expanded use of e-notarization and e-deliver documents, uh, I think everyone in the room could appreciate. You know, uh, since there is no three days prior to closing requirement now. Uh, we are often getting documents an hour before the closing and everyone's holding up other assignments. Um, sometimes we lose the signing agent and uh, I think a lot of the, the electronic delivery of those documents will, will get us past that hurdle of either the need to push back assignments, uh, cancel them, which causes all kinds of issues for all parties involved, whether it's redrawing docs or missing a funding for that uh, month, which is critical. So. I think it's a benefit to everybody involved. Well, I've been reminded several times here this afternoon that I'm the difference between us and the, and the cocktail hour. So I'd like to go ahead and, and, and try to finish on time. But we'll end this on a, on a fun note. I'd like every one of our panelists to share their, their, their worst exciting experience that they've had to deal with as an executive and also the best that, that they've, that's been brought to their attention. So we'll start with Sean and, and move all the way down towards Jim. Your best and worst. The best is uh, probably nothing near last year's about some signing agents saving individuals lives at the at the signing table that we heard at the conference but uh, there was one which I thought was relevant to this year's uh, apparent theme for the conference and especially the recognition of veterans and it had to do with the dual signing of a marine that was based in Afghanistan and uh, in an effort to get the the marines uh, signature on the document the signing officer via uh, an armed convoy rode Camelback into a remote outpost to obtain the signatures. Wow. So I was, uh, I thought that was pretty fitting in recognition of all the veterans, uh, you know, uh, as part of the conference. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty good one. Okay. Uh, the worst, it, it was, it's just a, a one I think that we could all take a, a good lesson from, and it has to do with, uh, you know, the obtaining of proper identification. Uh, of someone signing uh, the documents. Uh, our signing agent went to the closing. Uh, the borrower was a sheriff and he was in full uniform. And the co-borrower, his spouse, was also present but did not have her ID present. Uh, so of course, since there was a uniform law enforcement officer, the signing agent uh, accepted his acknowledgement that that was his wife and later uh, come to find out it was definitely his girlfriend. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, it was not one of your files, Thank Sam. You. It was not on the First American files. Oh. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so make sure you validate document uh, identification at the signing table, regardless of what type of uh, uniform personnel is present. Sally, any good stories from the field? I don't have any good stories like last year either, but uh, a couple I'll share with you. Um, one was, uh, it was at a conference like this and someone came up to me and started telling a story that I thought was going to be a, a horror story. Uh, he said that it, it was interesting that he, somehow there must have been some wires crossed on the communication side because he was not aware that the signing agent was going to show up at his house. And so was very surprised when there was you know, a knock at the door and somebody was standing there with documents and I'm going, oh no, no. But it turns out that it was a really, really, you know, he was very pleased. It was, it was convenient, saved him the drive he thought he was about to make, and it went very well, was very professionally done. So I was happy to hear that, that the turn of, of, of events and the story there. Um, but then at, at that same conference, someone else came to tell me a story where um, it was a California situation where the loan was being closed in an escrow office, and this was a purchase. It wasn't a refinance. 
And unfortunately, and this was actually a Wells Fargo employee telling me this story, so that's why they dialed me up. Um, but unfortunately, the signing agent was left alone with the customer while the escrow agent was sitting in the desk across the room. And uh, the signing agent must have been you know, quite new, um, didn't really know how to answer the questions and kept leaving to go get the answer and come back rather than the escrow agent being present and you know, participating or even, even coming to have a conversation firsthand with the customer. So in that example, you know, something that may seem as innocent as that type of a setup created a very, very negative customer experience and uh, one that would not, you know, we would not like to consider as the model. Ryan, be be I, best and worst stories? I can't really touch uh, Sean's story there. Yeah, that, was, that was a good one. Camel, um, really? A camel? But <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I don't have, a, don't have a story with a camel, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that each and every day um, we know, all of us know, uh, that there's a lot of amazing things happening out there that, that you guys do, whether it be going out again with a fifth set of documents when they're correct, or um, you know, going out in, in storms. You know, uh, every winter we hear stories about notaries that, against our advisement, try and get our, our deals done in, in inclement weather, and um, it, it does often go unrecognized. And for that, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I can say is. As a company, we're trying to do better in, in recognizing your, your efforts and, and thanking you for them. Um, on the downside, uh, a story comes to mind. Um, I know perhaps the um, questions about why we, we require background checks have, have died down a bit over the years, but um, there was a time, some of us may remember, when background checks weren't standard and, and weren't uh, required uh, in our industry. Um, we had a, a closing in a rural area. Uh, we didn't have an agent. Um, in the days before background checks, we reached out to a signing agency and they found a notary for us. Um, we weren't very familiar with this notary, obviously. However, our borrower was. Uh, borrower was from a small town, happened to be an FBI agent, and knew that this notary uh, had been, uh, had some prostitution charges uh, against her. And that her husband had been um, brought up on some uh, charges that his partner was investigating. Wow. So um, that is, is case in point why we have background checks here, you know, now in, in, in these days and ages. So um, we, of course, had canceled that closing before she received the loan documents and um, put a lifetime ban on her from, uh, from our network. So. Probably why you don't allow solicitation for other businesses <laughs> at the <laughs> All right, Sam, the bar's been up. Let's hear your story. Oh, I know. This is going to be tough. Um, so, uh, good story. Uh, and there's probably more good stories than bad, but um, uh, just two quick ones. Uh, one notary went to the airport to meet a borrower to sign. Uh, the documents and they were between flights but they were able to um, the borrower was willing to basically go downstairs and the notary had a sign like you would for a driver you know <laughs> waiting for their passenger and they were able to sign the the loan documents the other was uh, the borrower did not have their cashier's check uh, ready at closing and so the notary uh, offered to follow the borrower to their bank and wait out in the parking lot while they went in and got the cashier's check and completed the signing um, on a not so great note, and I, I guess it's all in how you view it, um, we had a situation where uh, it was a very wealthy uh, borrower. She was the only signer. Her attorney was present. Apparently she had a little habit of drinking and um, invited the notary to drink with her before she signed. And uh, one drink led to another. <laughs> Um, both were not able to do anything at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got the call the next day from uh, the consumer's attorney saying that both behaviors weren't acceptable, but that, that's my story and I'll stick with it. Customer satisfaction. Jim, you got anything to top that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Okay, 99 out of 100 are, are, are good because you're, you're, 
your, your professionals and the, the, the ones that aren't just don't, don't last in the business. But there's, there's one signing that I can recall, uh, mostly because of uh, the bank messed it up. You know, it's the three times trying to get the documents right. And finally, the customers at the airport, they're at JFK. And what made this so, uh, I guess, poignant to me, they, they were flying out of the country to formalize an adoption. They, and it, this had to be done. We had to sign. They got there at 11.30 that evening. You know, the, the signing agent just went above and beyond to, uh, to make that, that happen. And it, uh, it, it stands out to me to, to this day uh, because of what, what was needed, you know, what was going to happen with the, with the funds. Uh, the, the worst, I don't know if this is the worst one that I can recall, but there was this signing in Chicago, Illinois, and um, it was a woman that happened to work for us. She was an attorney for us. And uh, she called me the next day and uh, explained to me that the uh, signing agent, the, the fellow, made uh, some improper advances. Um, and that wasn't the worst part because, you know, they've got all their personal information, and he proceeded to tell her that she was uh, looking at her app that she was underpaid. Um, for her position, and uh, yeah, this was somewhat embarrassing for us. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I yeah. promise I try to end on time because we are the difference um, between uh, us and the, and the cocktail hour. But I, I do want to thank you all for attending. I want to thank all of our panelists for coming. Uh, Ryan alluded to uh, recognizing your efforts and, and the fact that we have executives from uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Minneapolis flying all this way. Uh, to spend time with you and, and, and hear your needs, I think says a lot for how important you are to the industry. Uh, so thank you again for attending and, and we'll be around to answer any questions you have. Thank you.